G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel, continuing this off-season series I've started where I go through each individual AFL team, and I have a little crack at sort of uh, talking about how their season went, analyzing their best 22, and making some calls on um, to what extent I rate the 22, where the gaps are, potentially uh, what they could look at in terms of improving that best 22 as well. And uh, so far on the series, I've been doing it reverse alphabetical order, which meant I start with the Western Bulldogs uh, like a week ago, maybe less. Uh, then I've done the Eagles, had the Sydney Swans yesterday, and then today I'm going to be doing the St Kilda Football Club. So uh, it's going to run in the usual format, how I've done it with previous videos. And if you want to find those other videos, um, by all means, go to the playlist tab on this YouTube channel, and you will find it, uh, I think it's called Team-Based Videos for 2024, I think. Uh, so I'm going to continue with this. Next is going to be Richmond, and so on and so forth. So before I get into it, if you could do me a favor and subscribe to the channel, help me hit 25K by the end of the year. That would mean a lot. Thank you. Cool, so let's talk about the St Kilda Football Club, uh, a team that uh, is notoriously hard to get your head around in terms of exactly how they're going to go. Um, it feels like they do kind of subvert expectations a little bit. They certainly did in 2023, uh, particularly when you consider new coach, Ross Lyon re-enters the fold. Uh, but going into round one and the start of the season, I think they had 14 injuries on their injury list, which is pretty nuts. Uh, and when you consider some of those names included Max King, Tim Membry, so they're two key uh, forward targets. Seb Ross from the midfield, Jack Billing, Zach Jones, Nick Caulfield, and Jack Hayes. So those are probably the bigger names that were on their injury list, but of course there were more. Uh, but sure enough, they start the season well, defy the odds to some extent, win six of their first eight and set up their season beautifully. And not only that, sort of got back to that signature Ross Lyon defensive game style where they really sort of cramp oppositions. In fact, they only conceded 71.6 game, uh, points per game in 2023, which was uh, effectively made them the best defensive team in the AFL. On the flip side, offensively, they weren't so strong. I think they ranked bottom four for uh, like scores or goals. Uh, that was the way I looked at it. And then I think they were also 12th in the league for generating inside 50s. And then I think they were also uh, last in the competition for converting inside 50s to goals. Um, so you can see that there's some forward half issues there for the St Kilda Football Club. But when you consider as well their injury list, uh, it's hard to blame them. And of course, also adapting to a new game style. So they made the finals, obviously lost in week one to the Giants. But when you consider they had finished 10th the previous two seasons, it's certainly a year of improvement. And further to that, I think there's a lot of positives with some of the young talent they've uh, recruited. And of course, the fact that uh, at times they were one of the hardest teams to play, particularly early in the season. So it's interesting to look back at uh, that team that made a semi-final in 2020, uh, where they lost to Richmond. And uh, you look at the team, a lot of the core players are still there, but there has been a, a new refreshed look um, headlined by some great recruiting, particularly through the draft, I would say. So let's uh, just cover off their off-season, the key to listings that I had. Or when I say delistings, listings, I actually mean just players who left the list generally. Uh, so that includes Jack Billings, Jade Gresham, uh, moved to Melbourne and Essendon respectively. Then Nick Caulfield joined the Western Bulldogs via trade. Then they cut a number of other players, Jack Bartel, Leo Connolly, Oscar Adams, Dan McKenzie, and Tom Highmore. So a little bit of a clean out there for St Kilda. Jack Paris was another name that I forgot to mention there. But in terms of what they've added to the list, uh, the biggest recruit was Liam Henry via trade uh, for Fremantle there. Uh, they also required Paddy Dow as a bit of a cheap trade from Carlton there, who was kind of stuck in the VFL. Darcy Wilson and Lance Collard were their first two picks in the draft, and then they uh, added Hugo Garcia, Angus Hasty, and Ari Shonmaker as well. So with that in mind, I have had a crack at trying to plot their best 22. And this was one of the more difficult ones I've done in the sense that there were just some key, uh, not key position, but um, key roles within the team where I had a genuine 50-50 uh, as to who I was going to select. But this is what I've gone with here. Uh, in particular, down back was a little tricky deciding, you know, between Zane Cordy and Dougal Howard. I've decided to go for Dougal Howard. I think he was in the side until he had surgery on his wrist uh, at the sort of middle of last year. Uh, but otherwise, other than that, obviously, like it's a really strong backline, particularly with their run and carry and rebound. So Cal Wilkie was an All-Australian defender for a start. But I also think the emergence of Wanganeen Miller and, of course, Jack Sinclair consistently being an absolute gun, one of the best players in the comp for his position, if not the best. Uh, so there's, there's genuine balance there between uh, tall and small prowess, the ability to rebound and set up play, in particular with Wanganeen Miller. I think uh, he's been a bit of a massive find for the Saints. Some out there believe, you know, Jimmy Webster might not start round one. It might be Liam Stocker. I'm not too sure. I just went for the safer, more experienced option there. Um, but there's a number of players I left out. But before I get into that, we'll talk about the midfield. Liam Henry joins them on a wing. And uh, suddenly, you know, for a team that was looking to bolster outside run and carry, uh, I think they certainly did that through both trade and draft this year. With Liam Henry on a wing, uh, just looks a little bit quicker. And naturally, he can play a little bit forward as well. So they've got, they've always uh, historically had 
over the last few years anyway, a pretty big bodied engine room that can win plenty of the football, but it's their transition and their movement inside 50, which has probably let them down a little bit. Some one-dimensional midfielders in there. I mean, Jack Steele is an absolute star of the competition, but guys like Seb Ross, Zach Jones, uh, to some extent Brad Crouch as well, they're all kind of same-ish. So what I think they've done a good job with is over the last couple of years adding some outside class. So Brad Hill has played well at times, sometimes on a back flank, I think, but I've chucked him on a wing here. Uh, Liam Henry comes in to bolster that. Mason Wood, as a delisted free agent, they signed as well. Uh, but I've chucked him on the bench here. He's a little bit unlucky, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, because, of course, he's uh, probably going to be a fairly key player for them in 2023. Uh, picking, you know, the, the midfield was a little tricky. Uh, I did a little bit of research, and there's fans out there who think, you know, Paddy Dow starts round one ahead of Seb Ross. Again, I've picked conservative, but that's another uh, selection thing to consider. If I had to guess, I mean, I've picked Darcy Wilson as the sub here because I actually think he would be a very good impact sub, and I, I think they should slot him in round one, to be honest, for their general mix. But it could, that could easily be Paddy Dow. So uh, that's what I mean. There's a little bit more uh, subjectivity with their best 22 compared to some of the other teams I've done. I went with uh, Cooper Sharman up forward uh, over some options like Caminiti and Jack Hayes as well. I think uh, his end of the season was pretty strong. But again, that one's not so obvious. Uh, but there's a little bit of midfield depth there. You know, they've got like, as I said, Paddy Dow, uh, Zach Jones to some extent. I think he's fallen out of favor. Uh, but there is a little bit of really made depth there. But I think the forward line actually on paper is pretty strong. Um, and I know... This year, statistically, it didn't go well uh, or go really well. Um, and to what extent that's due to the injuries they had potentially, it's probably as much about getting a cohesive mix there that know how to play with each other because it was a bit of a mix and match this year for St. Kilda. And, uh, you know, Gresham and Billings played a bit of half forward too. So it's a new look team. But you consider Higgins, uh, Dan Butler, who I've got on the bench there, as smalls. They're pretty dangerous players. I think they both kicked over 30 this year. Uh, the talls in Membry and King are strong with Sharman in support. And Mateus Philippou, again, maybe he transitions into more of a midfielder in, over time, but as a dynamic sort of mid-sized option there, I think he gives them good balance there. Machito Owens is an absolute gun as well. Um, and it, it will be interesting to plot both the development of Owens and Philippou into potentially midfielders. I think that's on the table for both of them. Maybe not Philippou yet, but Machito Owens is... Uh, a proven gun in the forward line and if he can become a bit more of a dynamic on baller I think that's going to be almost crucial for the Saints moving forward because if I had a comment on that team it feels like the midfield is a lacks maybe a genuine um, well okay Jack Steele probably is an A grade or A plus mid on his day but you know another one I, I don't think the depth of talent through that midfield specifically is high enough to maybe compete with the best teams and I think St Kilda's kind of at that point where They've got to contemplate how do we become as good as the teams vying for the top four. I think that's their goal with the maturity of their list at the moment. So with that all in mind, you know, I think it's it's a settled defense uh, other than the the last position, position of like Dougal Howard and Zane Cordy. There's genuine competition for spots there, but generally that's a strong back six. Their defensive uh, pressure and their defensive game as a team is pretty strong. I think the midfield is previously been workmanlike, and I think they've improved the outside run and carry in particular with um, you know guys like Darcy Wilson as well, who could potentially come in potentially as a forward as well at first, and maybe he chops and changes. They can rotate Philippu, Owens, and Wilson in that forward line. Maybe Lance Collard gets a debut. Both of those players, I think, could come in at some point over the course of the season and really contribute to that side. And I think longer term, uh, I, while I think top-end midfield quality is probably the one thing I see lacking on that list, like I said, with Owens and Philippu, they could potentially transition to more full-time midfielders and there's there's high-end potential there, particularly with Philippou as well. He's a player that I really liked in his draft year. Sure, he leaps high and hits the scoreboard as a medium forward now, but if you chuck him on a wing, potentially rotating there, they've got options. Wood can rotate forward. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a good team and I think the more in-depth look I've had at St. Kilda you know, in preparation for this video, I'm a little bit higher on them than I used to be. I think uh, you can clearly see the strategy. They've executed on that strategy and uh, they're trying to improve some weaknesses. And I think, to be honest, I think it's been going pretty well lately. Uh, and in general, I've commented on how I think they've drafted well, partially with the help of some academy picks, obviously Owens and, and uh, Windhager. But Philippou, Wanganin, Miller, these guys have come in and made pretty immediate impacts on their side. I think they're at the stage now where, from a list point of view, their next you know, foray into the trade market, so to speak, or free agency market, is they're probably ready to look for a big fish. 
And we've seen them try and fail in the in previous years. I think you know Dugowie was one more, more recently, but I think if they can establish themselves as a finalist a couple of years in a row, playing that Ross Lyon brand, making them tough to beat, I think St Kilda could potentially be an attractive trade option for some big name players. Maybe not your Dusty Martin level players or anything like that, uh, but I think. With looking at the, some of the free agents or players out of contract this year, guys like Bailey Smith and Hugh McCluggage are both options I think St Kilda should pursue. I think that's time for them to look for that caliber of player at that point of their career. I'd also, to be honest, I, I don't know how real the Clayton Oliver trade suggestion is, is, to be honest. Like, obviously, there was all over the place the reporting of that story, but I think that's the sort of player that if they can get a little bit of a discount for him somehow, I know he's massively contracted, but... I think St Kilda should throw their hat in the ring for that. Otherwise, there's some other players, you know, Ben Keys potentially as a target. Obviously, I'm not saying that's realistic, but I know he's out of contract. Uh, I also listed Archie Perkins there. Could they pry him out of Essendon? Uh, potentially more of a lower level one is Connor Stone from GWS. If he doesn't get a gig there, uh, he's a sort of dynamic inside mid forward. Uh, I think there's some options there. It'll be interesting to watch St Kilda in 12 months' time and see what they do to improve their list because I think they've been fairly savvy in recent years. So to summarize my thoughts on the Saints, um, like I said, like the depth is solid. I think the best 22 is good. It's not necessarily going to be a top four contender, but ultimately what is more important, what tends to transcend the importance of you know best 22 quality is, is a team that plays to a game style and executes on that game plan week in, week out. And what has been a common trend for St Kilda in recent years has been uh, their ability to run out seasons. And, you know, they probably could have finished higher than they did this year, but they looked a little lackluster in the second half of the year. And I think in previous years, that's also been the story. Is it because they play such a high defensive pressure style that it's hard to sustain? That's one thing to consider. But I see St Kilda's quality of certainly being capable of being the top eight. I don't think I had them in my eight when I did the prediction. But evaluating where their list is now, and I see the balance in it, um, I think it's a good solid team. And if you take a good solid team and give them a ripping game plan, then they could surprise a few this year. So I'm intrigued to see uh, how St Kilda do um, and how their sort of next premiership window kind of unfolds because I think the maturity of their list suggests it might be closer than we think. I don't know if they've got the top end talent to contend yet, but like I said, they can probably look to rectify that in the trade market. So let me know, Saints fans, uh, what you thought of this analysis and the 22. Like I said, it, uh, this is an outsider fan trying to uh, trying to plot their best 22. It's not that easy. We're all going to have different opinions. Um, and, you know, I trust St Kilda's fans' opinions on their best 22 more so than mine. It was just uh, trying to analyze it and see what the strengths and weaknesses are. But anyway, thank you for watching. Uh, let me know in your thoughts in the comments below whether you go for St Kilda or not, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.